Um, hello, my name is Jane Hafner, and I have been a nurse for over 40 years. And for over 40 years, I've been a nephrology nurse. So I have worked with people who are on hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, people with transplants. And I've also worked with people who are not on dialysis or have a transplant yet, but are preparing um, for that. And they know that they have chronic kidney disease. So um, I congratulate you for um, watching this because this is the right thing to do to, to start getting information. So I am going to talk to you about hemodialysis. You have heard about the kidneys working as a filter. You've heard about peritoneal dialysis and how it works as a filter. Now I'm going to tell you about this other kind of dialysis called hemodialysis and how it works. Heme means blood. So this means that your blood circulates outside your body in order for the toxins and the extra fluid to be removed. So the way that that works is um, there's a machine where your blood circulates outside your body through an artificial filter, which we call a dialyzer, or sometimes we call it a kidney, and that works as the filter since your kidneys aren't doing it. You can do this by going to a dialysis unit, which is what people most often hear about, where you go three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or you also can do this at home. You can do this during the day for two, three, four hours, or you can also do it at night. You can, and you can do both of those at home or going to a dialysis center. Um, this therapy uses needles, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, more later. So what does the hemodialysis actually do? It, remove, it does not replace everything that your kidneys do. It, there are a lot of functions to the kidneys that you would have heard about earlier. Not all of those are replaced by hemodialysis. It removes the waste products. Um, when a person starts on dialysis, there are labs that they do monthly, and there's a calculation to figure out if it is cleaning your blood well enough. It's called a KT over V. You don't need to remember that now, but you'll hear about it later. There's also another test called a urea reduction ratio, URR. It's another way to measure how well is this particular prescription, the amount of time on dialysis and that sort of thing, how well is it cleaning your blood? Because it's individual for everyone and it changes from month to month. That's why it's, this is done monthly um, because your prescription can change. There are, they will always be looking at it closely. The other part of this is that it removes fluid. So essentially, Hemodialysis is taking care of what should be in your urine, the fluid and the waste products. So we'll talk more later about exactly what all happens in a, during a dialysis treatment, but you weigh before and after a treatment so that that's how you can determine how much fluid needs to be removed, um, which is, would be like the urine that you normally would urinate. Um, and so we'll talk about that more. It's called a dry weight or an optimal weight. And that's something that gets evaluated every day, very, very frequently. So those are the two things that the hemodialysis does. Removes the toxins that are building up in your blood that your kidneys are not filtering and removes the extra fluid that your kidneys are not um, removing. So how well does that happen? That's a, that's a good question. Here is a, here's a, where I like to talk about supersizing. Supersize has gotten kind of a bad rap um, in the last few years, if you supersize your french fries or your drink or something like that, that's not a good thing. When you're looking at all this and you're, you're looking at your options, you want to think about how can I supersize dialysis treatments or supersize the removing of these poisons and fluid but still have my life. So healthy kidneys remove, and clean, remove the fluid and clean blood 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That is 168 hours a week. If you go to a dialysis unit three times a week, that's usually between nine and 12 hours a week. So hemodialysis three times a week for three to four hours each day removes only 10 to 15% of your body waste for each treatment. Earlier you heard about the, the stages of chronic kidney disease and when is it determined that you need dialysis? When you need dialysis is when you have about 10 to 15%. Um, and so that's about what you maintain with the three times a week dialysis. So in order to get more dialysis, get it longer or more frequent, there are a variety of ways to do that. One is you can go to a dialysis unit and do nocturnal, do it at night where you can get up to eight hours, or you can do it at home where you can do it more frequently and not just the three times a week. 
And so then you feel better, you remove the toxins more often, you don't have as much fluid to remove, and we'll talk about all that a little bit more later. So what you, want the, what you need to understand is, if, when you're doing dialysis, this is not a 24 hour, 24, seven day a week thing, so whatever your prescription is, you want to really try to stick to that. I always tell people, don't let anybody cheat you out of any dialysis time. I, I, sometimes people will say, oh, they cut me back to three hours and 45 minutes. And I say, don't let them cut you back. You need every minute you possibly can get. Okay, so what do hemodialysis machines look like? Some of you maybe have seen someone in a dialysis unit. There are a variety of machines. Um, there's most of the machines that are in dialysis units are good size. They're the size of a small refrigerator, um, and they have a water system that goes with them that purifies the water before it gets to the, to the machine. You can use machines that size at home also. More people use a machine at home that is smaller. It's a, it weighs about 70 pounds, and it's about the size of an old-fashioned 13-inch um, TV. Um, and so that's, a little, that's smaller and um, more portable. So what are the parts of a dialysis machine? You can go and visit at different dialysis units and there will be different machines in different dialysis units. There are a variety of companies that make different machines, but they all do the same thing in, in the end. There will be different paraphernalia, there's different pumps, they do different things, they might look differently, but they all do the same thing. What happens is they get access to your blood, and we'll talk about that in more detail later, but blood comes out of your arm goes through some pumps, goes through an artificial filter, which this is an example of what one can look like. So this is the artificial um, filter, or the dialyzer, and then it returns um, back to you. So at, at any given time, there is a cup of blood, not even a cup of blood usually, circulating outside your body going through this filter. And um, that the filter is where everything happens. So like I said, the machines can look different. They will have different pumps, different paraphernalia. All the work happens in this artificial um, dialyzer. This is where the toxins and the extra fluid are removed and go down the drain. So you've got, you have a pump with your blood circulating through the filter. So during your dialysis treatment, you're, you have a, less than a cup of blood circulating outside your body. Dirty blood goes into the dialyzer, clean blood comes out and, and continues to go back in is the way that that works. So there are different monitors on the machine. They will monitor pressures of different things. If you know something's plugged up or clotted or anything like that, there, there'll be alarms. So in a dialysis unit, you hear a lot of different beeps and alarms and that sort of thing. So how does a dialyzer work? So I showed you what this was here. Inside of a dialyzer, and there are different sizes of these, this shows you the inside of one that's been cut open. But what it is, is there are thousands of little hair-like fibers in there. What happens is the blood comes in, the dirty blood comes, comes in, goes in there and goes inside of those little tiny hair-like fibers. They are so tiny, but the red blood will go inside of those fibers. So the blood is coming, dirty blood is coming inside the fibers, clean blood will be coming out. So you're, the blood will be circulating that way. Then what happens is a solution. You heard with the peritoneal dialysis that, about the solution that you put into your peritoneum and it pulls the poisons and the extra fluid out and then it goes down the drain. The very same type of fluid is used here. It's a fluid that does not have creatinine, does not have urea, does not have all those toxins in it that, that are building up in your blood. So the blood is going one direction inside these fibers the dialysate or that solution is going the other directions and is on the outside of these fibers. So very often you'll hear it called a bath. What kind of bath are you, you on? You'll hear in a dialysis unit, How, what potassium bath are you on? That sort of thing. It's because these little fibers are being bathed in that solution. So the dirty blood's going this way, the clean solution is going this way, and in here, it is pulling through osmosis and diffusion, it's pulling those toxins and extra fluid out of your blood and that goes down the drain then. So that is how that is working. So it's, if you think about um, a tea bag, if you have a tea bag 
and you put it in water. If you think of the tea as the poisons inside of that blood, and you think of the bag, the tea bag, as all these little fibers, when you put tea in water, because there isn't tea in the water, the tea gets pulled out. And then at, when you get to the point where there's no more, uh, when it's equal, then, then it doesn't pull any more tea out. So that's kind of what's happening inside here, is it's pulling those toxins that are building up in your blood so that they can go down the drain. So here's a big question. How do we get access to your blood in order to have your blood circulate through this filter? And this is, this is a key, this is a big discussion here. So, and we'll get into a lot more details about it right now. You go to a surgeon, a vascular surgeon, and they create what we call an access because we have to have access to your blood. We need one place for the blood to come out, the other place for the blood to return to. Where it comes out, we call it arterial. Where it returns, we call it venous, but it is all the same blood. So there are three different kinds of accesses. One is a fistula, and that is, that's what's the preferred access to have. The next one is a graft, and then there's also what we call a catheter, which or, or we like to consider those as temporary. So right now what I'd like to tell you is, if you're in discussion with your nephrologist and you're determining that you're wanting to do hemodialysis when the time comes, if, you're, if, you're, if your nephrologist is recommending that you go see a vascular surgeon, I recommend you do it and I recommend you thank your nephrologist for being proactive for you. Don't let it scare you to think that that means your, your nephrologist thinks you need dialysis tomorrow but as we talk about this, you'll see that there's a process to getting this ready so that when the time comes that you need dialysis, you will avoid a lot of drama by already having your access in place. So, so if that discussion comes about, don't let it scare you. You have a doctor that's just wanting to be proactive. So what is a fistula? A fistula is your own blood vessel. What happens is that the surgeons will put it have an, you'll have an incision either maybe down here in your wrist or up here maybe um, near your elbow. And what they do is they take an artery and a vein and they connect it. Arterial, the ar arterial blood is what's coming from your heart and so it has more pressure behind it. And arteries are deeper. Veins are the things that, the blood vessels that you see up on top that when you go have your blood drawn, that's where they draw blood is out of a vein. So what they do is they take that arterial blood that has more pressure behind it from your heart, they connect it to the vein, and slowly but surely, that vein, which is closer to the, to the surface, gets bigger. And you want it to be big because eventually you're gonna have two needles that go in there, one for the blood to come out and one for the blood to go back in. And they're good sized needles, they're good sized needles, and you need them to be good sized because when you start a treatment, you turn a pump on, and it, you want that pump to be able to pull the blood fast enough to get your blood cleaned efficiently during, during that treatment. So that's why we have to build up an access. Regular blood vessels, like you can go in the hospital and they can put an IV in, but they couldn't turn a pump on to, to that IV and be able to pull the blood as fast as what, um, what you want. So that's why you have to develop something. So this fistula, that's your own blood vessel, and it is gonna take some time to get built up so it's big enough to put those needles in, which is why if your doctor refers you to a surgeon early on, that's why it's good to get it early on. People sometimes have a fistula in place for a year or more before they actually need it, but then when you need to start dialysis, there's just one less thing to have to worry about. You've got it ready. S avoid a lot of drama that way. So they, they will teach you how to, how to take care of it, how to exercise it so that it, it will get bigger for, for when the time comes um, that you need it. The reason fistulas are what you, the surgeon wants to consider first is because there's nothing artificial. It's all your own vessel. They tend to last much longer than any of the other accesses. Um, the surgery is easier, the recovery time is, is much easier, they don't clot or get infected as, as often. So this is what surgeons will look at first. So when you go to see the surgeon, they usually do something called vein mapping or maybe an ultrasound because they wanna see where are your blood vessels in your arm. Um, and then that way they know 
where to go to try to find the good ones that will develop into a good fistula for you. So if they find though that you don't have any vessels that are gonna work for a fistula, maybe they're really tiny or maybe you've had through the through the years you've had a lot of different procedures and those vessels you know have had other 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 tubes in them um, then a graft is, a, is what they can use and a graft is an artificial piece of tubing and here is an example of one it's a Teflon Gore-Tex type material and it's like a straw and if you feel it it's just real soft and slick so it's like a straw so one end they attach to an artery, the other end they attach to a vein, and very often it will, you'll have an incision here, and it makes what looks like a horseshoe. With the fistula, it looks more like a snake. It's one long strip going up your arm. Usually with a graft, it will be, look like a horseshoe. Sometimes when they, if they have to put it in, in the upper part of your arm, it, it can look like a horseshoe, or it might look straight there also. So with the graft, you don't have to have it in place quite as long. You can usually use a graft within a couple of weeks because it doesn't have to develop. It's whatever size the surgeon put in. But you have to wait. There is more recovery time in terms of how it feels. With the fistula, you have a little incision. It's a little bit sore. That's it. With the graft, there's a little more technique, a little, little more. They have to work in under the tissue a little bit more to, to get that tube in there. and it doesn't belong in your body. And so sometimes your body will react to it. So there can be more swelling, more redness, it can be more tender. So sometimes, and usually in a couple of weeks, that's all taken care of. But so initially, it may not feel as comfortable, but you can use it quicker if, if that is what the surgeon determines that, that you have to have it is a graft, okay? So we consider this to be the second best access. So, what if something happens? I always like people to know, even though you're doing the right thing by getting this information, hopefully you'll be proactive and you'll have everything in place as it needs. Some things, some nice things happen. Some nice things happen and you suddenly need dialysis. I don't want you to think that, oh my gosh, I don't have a plan. I don't have any kind of an access. What, what would happen if I needed it suddenly? If you need dialysis suddenly, they can accomplish that within just a couple of hours if need be. Hopefully, hopefully the fact that you're getting this information, you're gonna be able to avoid that. But the way that they can do it in a very quick manner is by putting in what they call a catheter. And this is an example of what one of those catheters look like. Now, remember I said we need a way to get the blood out to circulate through the, through the filter and to be returned to you. So with a catheter, what happens is they put this in usually in your chest, so it's coming out like this, and you've got caps on here that you take off, blood comes out of one side and blood is returned through the other. A radiologist can put this in, um, some nephrologists can put it in at the bedside, so this is not something that has to be prepared and it, it can be used instantly. So if, if all else fails and you do need to start dialysis sooner um, than, than you were able to put a plan in place, you can still get dialysis, okay? That would be considered usually temporary and then they would go ahead and plan to get you a fistula or a graft so that you can get the catheter out. Catheters are considered to be temporary for a couple of reasons. You very often can't turn that blood pump up, up as fast with these, so you don't get your, your blood clean quite as well. There's a higher risk of infection because it's something sticking out of your body um, and going right into a blood vessel, um, and it can damage blood vessels. And so usually we want to consider these to be a temporary um, access. So what can you do now to be proactive um, in addition to getting this information? What you, if at all possible, if you could avoid getting a pick line, that would be good. And if you've, if you've never had a pick line, you don't know what it is. And if you have, then you, you do know. But uh, a pick line is where they sometimes will put in, it'll be a line that very often will go into your, um, your elbow. And it's for long-term antibiotics and things like that. Or sometimes if you've been in the hospital and you're having to get fluids for quite a while. Anyway, that can damage the blood vessels in your arm. So what you're wanting to do going forward now is protect those blood vessels. Even if you think you wanna do peritoneal dialysis, I still recommend that right now you start protecting your blood vessels because they're the only set of blood vessels you've got and you're, you're, you're probably gonna need them someday. So 
Um, if you were in a situation and they were, someone was recommending putting in a pick line, I would have a discussion. And it might be that that's what you need to do at that point in time in order to treat whatever's going on, but it definitely is worth um, a discussion to say that you don't want that unless you absolutely have to. Um, avoid any IVs um, and or blood draws in your arm that is your non-dominant arm. What the surgeons try to do is if you're right-handed, they will try to put your axis in the left hand or vice versa, because that way when you're on dialysis and that arm has needles in it, you still have your dominant um, hand to do things with. So if you are right-handed, stop having anybody put IVs or draw blood from your left arm. Say, try, try to protect those blood vessels. Um, don't use any IV recreational drugs. Don't be shooting up anything. If you haven't already, then don't start. And if you are, you might ask for some help to avoid that because that just damages the blood vessels. Um, there are exercises that you can do to help strengthen those blood vessels. You know how you see construction workers, people that have been doing weightlifters, how their vessels are nice and big? You, you can start doing things like that. And you can ask your doctor if, if you should be doing anything like that. Um, so really and truly what you want to, eventually this could be your lifeline, so you want to start protecting it now. So don't have anything done, you know, even blood pressures um, in that arm unless you absolutely have to and have a good discussion about it. Um, so what I already had mentioned that it's a good idea to have a plan in place. Obviously you already know that your kidney function isn't normal or you wouldn't be listening to this. And so, like I said, if your doctor recommends seeing the vascular surgeon, I would say go ahead and do it. So you can avoid drama later, and if you can avoid a catheter, like, like we mentioned before. Um, so what are some problems that you can have with, with accesses? You can have infection. I mean, in any time, because for every dialysis treatment, two needles are going to go into your, into your arm. And so anytime, anytime you enter a blood vessel, there's a possibility of an infection. That can become sepsis. If you've ever had sepsis, that's where your bloodstream gets an infection. You can have bruising. You can have clotting. That seems to be our biggest problem is, is with these accesses clotting up. Um, and you learn how to feel for it. It feels you have a, a swoosh that goes through there and they will teach you how to, how to feel that and what to do if, um, if you don't feel it. Um, you can have poor blood flow. If you have little tiny vessels, or may, sometimes the vessels can have narrow areas in them. Um, and so that can give you not as efficient of a dialysis. Um, you can have an access that stops working. And um, actually with hemodialysis, the biggest problem that we've had for 40 years, and, and it's kind of continuing, is, is problems with the access. Um, you can have aneurysms. Sometimes if you've ever, if, met someone who's been on dialysis, it may look like a snake going up their arm and it may look like a very lumpy snake. Those are called aneurysms, those little, those little lumpy spots. Um, and so those are some of the problems that, that can occur with this. Now this is arterial blood, which the, this is the blood coming from, from your heart. So you want to be careful using power tools and things like that, because if you were to cut this, it, it can bleed quickly. You learn, though, when, when they place these, they teach you what to do if, if any of these things happen. So what are some things that you would want to do to protect your access? Maybe by the time you're watching this, you already have an access in place. So some things you want to do is, is protect the blood flow going through there. So you don't want to sit around with your elbow bent. You don't want to sleep on that arm. You want to get in the habit of sleeping with it straight out. You don't want to wear a tight um, watch on there, a tight shirt. If you're a, a woman, uh, you don't want to carry a heavy bag on there for a long time. Like I said, don't let anybody take a blood pressure or draw blood or anything from that um, arm. It, and don't let anybody draw, you know, come, just don't let anybody come near that arm unless they're a dialysis person and they know what to do. You, what else can you do to protect it? Um, only use it, only use it for dialysis. When you go to, a, if you have to go to another lab to have blood drawn, it might be tempting to say, hey, go ahead and draw it out of this nice big vessel. Don't let them do it. They don't know how to stick a dialysis access. Don't let them do it. Um, you want to check it every day. Like I said, you will be taught to, to what it should sound like, what it should feel like, and you will call immediately um, your clinic or your doctor 
if, if something doesn't feel or sound right. Report any infection. If it looks red, warm, has any kind of drainage or anything like that, you would want to call and get that addressed right away. You want to keep it clean, um, clean and dry. Um, when, you're you, when you're using it in the dialysis unit, there are a couple of different techniques uh, for putting those needles in. One is called a rope ladder, where you put you, the two needles are, each time you go, they're moved up, 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 um, so that you're not putting the needles in the same general area over and over. Um, another technique is called a buttonhole technique, which is where you, you do put the needle in exactly the same place over and over, and you develop kind of a, it's kind of like a pierced earring kind of track, where then you can put a blunt needle in there in the same place over and over. So your dialysis unit and the nurses that you work with will teach you the various things about that. Um, so now I'll tell you a little bit about what it's like to go to a dialysis unit and how, how it's scheduled. So most, a lot of dialysis is done at dialysis units. Um, there seems to be one on every corner in a lot of places anymore. It's become like CVS and Walgreens. There's, there's be across the street from each other. Usually it's three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, and then the time can vary. Also dialysis units have nocturnal, which is usually three nights a week. Um, and that can vary. It might be Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. It might be Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, for nocturnal. So if you decide you're going to do dialysis in a dialysis unit and it's, it's time to do it, your doctor would call and find out what the schedule is. Every dialysis unit is a little bit different with their schedule. Some start at 4 in the morning. Start, some start at 7 in the morning. Some are, you know, run three, four shifts a day. So some you could dialyze in the evening if you're working during the day. So you would just have to find out at the specific dialysis unit you're interested in um, what their schedule is like. And if it doesn't meet your needs, then you can ask about where's one that has evening dialysis or, or whatever. So here's what happens. You go to the dialysis unit. Let's say it's your schedule is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's Monday morning. You go to the dialysis unit. You will be in a waiting room with a group of people that you see every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning. You get to know these people really well. You become each other's own friends and support group. You see them more often than you probably do most of your family. So they will have you wash your arm. They will have you stand on a scale to see what you weigh. The nurse or the technician will tell you, come on in, your machine is ready. So you'll go into the room where there are a variety of, um, it varies from clinic to clinic how many dialysis units are in there, or machines are in there, but there will be a recliner chair sitting next to a machine. Usually there's a TV that hangs off the wall that you um, can watch TV while you're in there. So, so you will weigh yourself, you will go over, the nurse or technician will check your blood pressure, your temperature, they'll listen to your lungs, they're gonna feel on your ankles, see if you have any swelling. They're going to calculate based on what you weigh. When you left dialysis on Friday, you would have weighed at the end of the treatment. So they, they subtract what you weigh today from what you weighed on Friday when you left, and then they know how much fluid your body retained over the weekend. Because when your kidneys are not working, I'm sure you heard this earlier, very often then you're not producing the urine. So everything you take in that's fluid stays in your body. So that's how we kind of know how much stayed in there. So you weigh yourself, you've washed your arm, they're gonna put a blood pressure cuff on your arm that will stay on during the whole treatment. You'll get yourself all nestled into your chair, you'll have your blanket and your pillows and whatever else it is you need to get nestled in. They usually will have you put your feet up. They will ask you, has anything changed since the last time you were here? Have you been to the doctor? Any medication changes or anything like that? And then um, I recommend that you learn how to put your own needles in. Um, but some places, the, the nurse or the technician might put the needles in. I recommend you get it in the back of your head that you wanna put your own needles in because once you've done it yourself, you won't want anyone else to do it. But anyway, so two needles get put in your arm, and I would never tell anybody that having two needles put in your arm that you're not gonna feel that. Um, once they're in, they shouldn't be painful, you shouldn't feel anything. If you do, you need to tell somebody because maybe the tape needs to be adjusted or the needle needs to be adjusted, but don't expect that when you're sitting there during a dialysis treatment 
that, that the needles should hurt. There really shouldn't be anything uncomfortable about the treatment, except for putting the needles in. Once the needles are in, they start the treatment, they start the blood pump and the blood circulates outside your body and your blood starts getting cleaned. What I, what I really want to impress upon you here is this is not an uncomfortable procedure. Like I said, just you'll feel the needles, but once it's not an uncomfortable procedure, most of the time you can go into a dialysis unit and everyone is asleep. So no one is in pain, no way, it's not uncomfortable. It's boring, it's scary the first time. The, the very first time is definitely the scariest. And then once that first time is over, then you can like, whew, okay, that wasn't so bad. So during the treatment then, there's always staff around, there's always people around to check on you. Um, your blood pressure will be checked frequently because a couple of things that can happen during the treatment have to do with the fluid being removed. So I told you that they can figure out how much fluid was retained in your body on this Monday morning from Friday afternoon and they can figure out how much of that can we remove today. And there was a lot of discussion on that. How much can we remove without making you feel bad? And so they can set the machine. The machine can be programmed to remove a certain amount of fluid. And one thing just to keep in mind, all of a sudden you're gonna weigh in kilograms instead of pounds. So you're gonna feel like you weigh a whole lot less because kilograms <laughs> makes you think you, that you weigh less. But um, So anyway, during the treatment, if the fluid removal is too fast or too much, a couple of things can happen. One is it can make your blood pressure drop, and that's why they're watching your blood pressure frequently. And they, you will want to report to them anything that feels different, anything that feels different. Sometimes as blood pressure starting to drop, you might feel hot. So the ner nurses and technicians are watching. If all of a sudden they see someone taking their blanket off, they will come and check your blood pressure. If they see you yawning, they will come and check your blood pressure because sometimes that means that it's dropping. But you, as, as knowing your body, you very often will learn what's happening. How do I feel before my blood pressure does drop? And then, and then they can take care of it. They can give you fluid or stop removing the fluid or whatever. So if anything feels different, you want to tell them. Don't think, oh, I don't want to be a problem. I don't want to say anything. Because if anything feels different, you need to report it. The other thing that can commonly happen, and a lot of this is at first, when they're figuring out your body and what you can tolerate, another thing that can happen is that you can get cramps. Because as these poisons are, are removed, as the toxins are removed, and the fluid is removed, nobody's really exactly sure why, but you can get cramps. And sometimes people, even before starting dialysis, have had cramps just because of some of these toxins building up. So if you're, you're laying there during your dialysis treatment, all of a sudden your big toe starts to cramp, you don't wanna be like, oh, let me try to work this out. You wanna tell somebody because then they can address it and they can take care of it really quickly for you. So those are the two things that happen kind of commonly at first until they figure out exactly what you need to weigh um, and what you can tolerate. So my point is, during a treatment, if something feels different, you need to tell somebody. And, and they are, there are always people around um, checking on you. So during a treatment, what most people do is read, uh, watch TV. Um, now people, most, most clinics will have Wi-Fi so you could bring in an iPad or you know play things on your phone do things like that, but honestly, most of the time when you go in, after people have been on for about an hour or so, people are asleep. So very, very often that's what, what people do to pass the time. Um, then at the end of the treatment, um, whatever the doctor prescribed as far as time-wise, at the end of the treatment then using a saline solution, which is like a salt solution, kind of like our tears, they will return the blood that is in the tubing so that you go home with the with as much blood as you came with. And then you do everything in reverse. They are going to, once they've returned your blood, they're gonna check your blood pressure to make sure it's not too low. They will put your feet down, have you stand up, make sure that because you had that fluid removed during the treatment, sometimes it takes our bodies a while to recover um, and have our blood pressure be normal. At this point, right at the beginning, you also sometimes get rid of blood pressure pills. Very often the doctors will end up being able to take care of blood pressure pills because the dialysis is helping with the fluid. So they check your blood pressure, check your temperature again, you know, look at your ankles again. They, they remove the two needles and you put pressure, you hold pressure where those needles were for about 10 minutes. They bandage that up. Then you go and you weigh yourself again. So 
Now you find out how much fluid did they actually remove. They set the machine to remove a certain amount. Now you're going to weigh to confirm that that amount of fluid was removed. Then you go home. You come back on Wednesday and you do the same thing again. And then you come back on Friday and you do the same thing. It's like laundry. It's never done. You just keep back you, and, and it's the same thing over and over. So after a couple of treatments, you, you get the routine and it, it is the same thing over and over. So what are some possible problems? I kind of already mentioned that. You can have some problems with, with the needles. And like I said, if anything is uncomfortable with the needles, you want to say something. Um, your blood pressure can get low, especially at first when you're maybe going to be getting rid of some blood pressure medicines and figuring out what your weight needs to be. I mentioned cramps. Sometimes people will get a headache during dialysis. Um, you can have problems with your access. Um, maybe if the blood flow is not good and that sort of thing. Um, then, so that's going to, that's what is going to end center dialysis. So there are dialysis units that have what is self-care, where you go and you are in the clinic, but you set up the machine or you put in your own needles and you run your treatment. Um, you have more control over what's going on with your treatment and that sort of thing. So some clinics will have a self-care area where you can do that sort of thing. And like, remember I mentioned earlier, I recommend if at all possible, you learn how to put your own needles in. Um, because your, your access will just um, last longer and you'll be happier if, if you do it that way. So you also can do this same treatment, the very same thing, which is a matter of the blood circulating through a filter to remove the toxins and the, the fluid. You can do this at home also. You can do it at home with a machine that looks like a little refrigerator, or you can do it with a smaller one um, that looks more like a little TV. Um, a dialysis unit will provide you what you need at home. They provide the machine, they provide uh, a recliner if you don't have one, they, they provide all of the supplies and things that, that you need um, in order to do it at home. Um, for some, they, you are required to have a partner trained with you. Um, the FDA has just approved that one, uh, one treatment, you don't have to have a partner as long as you and the doctor and, your, and the clinic think that, that that's all safe to do. Um, you can do this during the day three times a week, just like you would in center. You can do it more frequently, um, five, six, four, five, six times a week for shorter treatments, or you can do it at night. Um, and that varies from, some people do it six nights a week, some people do it every night. That varies a lot um, from person to person. So the benefits for doing this at home, number one is your schedule, because you can schedule it when you want. Um, and um, if you can do it more frequently, then you get the benefits of more frequent dialysis. But you, this is a commitment that you have to, you have to do it. You have to, you have to do what the clinic needs you to do. They have to have the records of your treatment as proof that, that you had your treatment and that sort of thing. Um, so the way it's scheduled, like I said, you could do it three times a week. You can do it every other day. You, um, some people will do it four to six days a week for two and a half or three and a half. Uh, ev for as many people as there are dialyzing at home, there are that many different kinds of schedules and prescriptions and things like that. You can change your schedule the way you need it. Um, if you're scheduled at a dialysis unit Monday, Wednesday, Friday at seven o'clock and something comes up and you need to really come in at 10.30, Sometimes that isn't possible if the dialysis unit is full. There might be somebody else in that chair. Whereas at home, you, you can adjust it how, how you want. Um, if you do home dialysis, sometimes at first people feel like, oh, maybe I'm going to, I got used to all those people in the dialysis unit. Um, there's a social worker, there's a dietitian, there's everybody there. If you do it at home, you come to clinic, usually most clinics have you come once a month. You draw your blood at, at, at home. You don't have to go anywhere to have your blood drawn. Um, you come once a month to evaluate your blood test, talk to the social worker, talk to the dietitian, see the doctor. Um, and these people are all available 24, you know, 24 seven. They, you have people available, the nurses and or technicians to help with, with any equipment questions. Um, so you're not out there on your own. You, you have lots of support. The supplies are delivered to your home once a month. That's one of the big um, shockers is the first time you get the delivery. 
no matter what kind of dialysis you do at home, whether it's peritoneal or hemodialysis, the first delivery is a lot of boxes. So that will, I always tell people that will give you a heart attack right off the bat, but that will be the biggest delivery you ever get. The, your deliveries after that will be smaller, but the first one just has a lot of variables to it. Um, and then once a month you call an inventory in to whatever company you're getting your supplies from and those supplies get delivered to you, to you once a month. So what are some disadvantages of going to the dialysis unit, okay? Um, some of the disadvantages um, um, are regular contact with other patients. Some people enjoy that and some people don't. It could depend on the group that you're with. Um, there is a high, a little bit higher infection risk um, because you're in a room with a large group of people. So there's more people that could be coughing and hacking and that sort of thing than there is in your own living room. The diet is more limited. I know you've already heard um, from the dietitian, but if you're only removing the toxins three times a week, you're limited on what on some of those that you can take in, like potassium and phosphorus and things like that, um, as well as fluid. Um, you have less control and you're more dependent on the staff. So that depends on what kind of person you are. Some people really need con more control of their situation. Sometimes. It, when something like this has happened, you feel like you've lost control. And so if you're in center and you feel you, like you don't have much control, that can, that can be hard. Um, some people like that. They don't want any control over it. And they're happy to be to let the staff do things. So it, very, it depends on, on how you feel about it. There are a lot more rules to follow because you're in a group in a room with a large group of people, there's a lot more rules about the visitors and what can you have food or drink when you're in there on the dialysis, that sort of thing. Depending on where you live, the time and the cost to travel to a clinic can be an issue. Um, and so that's something that can, that can be um, a disadvantage. Um, the schedule, like I said, is very is strict. Dialysis units will try to work with you though. If you need to be change your schedule for something, they really will try to work with you, but sometimes it's just not possible. Um, there, I'm sure you already heard from the social worker, but there is a three month wait um, if you don't already have Medicare, um, if, you go, if you do in-center dialysis. If you do home dialysis of any sort, the Medicare will start the month that you started. Um, and one of the things with in-center dialysis is you always have two days off between treatments like Saturday and Sunday or Sunday and Monday. And anytime that there's two days off, that is harder on your body. Um, there's a higher risk of ending up in the hospital with, and things like that. So that two day gap um, is, a, dis is a definite disadvantage. So what are some advantages of going to the dialysis unit? Like I said, one of the disadvantages could be that regular contact with all those people. That can also be an advantage. And very often that group of people you get close to and you get to know them really well. There are there's staff there to monitor you. There's staff there to take care of you. You have four days that um, you don't have to go. That can be an advantage. You don't have any machines or any supplies in your home. Um, and you, you still might be able to do nocturnal if your dialysis unit has that. Um, and you don't have to ask anyone for help or to be your partner um, or that sort of thing. So what are some disadvantages of doing this at home? You have it at your home. <laughs> you need space for the machine and the supplies. Um, and it's a reminder, it's a constant reminder that you are on dialysis and that you this, this is part of your life. Um, it takes time to learn it. Um, your training can take anywhere from three to five to six weeks. Um, and so sometimes that can be difficult to just schedule that, especially if you're working. Um, some clinics require a helper, trained helper, so sometimes that's hard to get someone to commit to, to, to being there with you. That doesn't mean they have to do anything. Sometimes the partner does a lot. Sometimes the partner is only there to call if you need help. Um, that can really vary. Um, some of the machines, you might need to do some plumbing to um, accommodate the water that's needed for the machine. Um, some of the machines don't need any plumbing um, um, changes in, in your home. And so that would vary um, from whatever uh, equipment you decided to use. Um, Medicare doesn't cover that sort of thing. Um, and um, Medicare, if you do home dialysis, will start right away. Sometimes it only pays for three times a week and then the dialysis unit has to justify why you need 
um, the other treatments. Uh, one of the other advantages to more frequent dialysis, regardless of what it is, is that um, when you do the in dialysis, I didn't mention that very often it takes you several hours to recover after a treatment until you feel like you're back to normal. And if you do it more frequently, the recovery time is only like an hour. And people that do it at night, nocturnally, don't really have any recovery time at all. So that's also something to think about. Um, so what are some of the advantages of home dialysis? You're in your home, you're in your own home. Uh, I saw a video the other day of a man and he had, there was a baby sitting next to him while he was having his treatment. The baby was in a high chair and he was just playing and giggling with the baby. So you can't do that in the dialysis unit. So you are in your own home. Um, you have more control, you are, have more independence. You, you tend to learn more about your treatment if, if you're in charge of it. You don't have to wait for the Medicare. Um, you can have fewer access problems, but even if you're in center, if you will put your own needles in, that will help you have fewer access problems. The more people that are putting needles in your arm, the more chances you have of there being issues. So that can, that can be taken care of by you just putting in your own needles. A more flexible schedule. Sometimes you want to dialyze at midnight, sometimes you want to dialyze at night in the morning. That, does, that isn't going to work at the dialysis unit, but at, at home it can. Your body doesn't care if it's noon or midnight when the toxins are being removed. Um, less travel to and from the clinic. So depending on how far you are or what your transportation situation is, um, or if it's blizzarding outside, if it's blizzarding outside, you can just be snuggled in, having your treatment, and not have to worry about those roads. So this can help you work and go to school because again, you can adjust your schedule. There are fewer rules. You can have something to eat, you can have visitors, you can have a baby in a high chair next to you. Um, and you can do just about any kind of schedule that you and your doctor figure out. You can do nocturnal, you can do it daily, you can do um, it how, however works best for you and, and your doctor um, prescribing it. Um, the diet is, more liberal. Because if you are getting rid of the toxins and the fluid more frequently, more days of the week, then you can eat and drink more. So your diet is not nearly as restricted. Um, and if you, if you want to decide to do it at, at night at home, then you've got the whole rest of the day. Not only do you get more dialysis and feel good, you've got the rest of your day to do whatever it is you need to be doing. So with more frequent dialysis, whether it's hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, the more time you spend removing toxins rather than them building up, you will feel better and live longer. And like I said, this is one time where supersizing is a good thing to think about because if you can supersize it and still have your life, then that's a good way to look at it. So you can still live a good life. With hemodialysis, it's obviously not anything anybody hopes to ever have to do, but it, it's definitely doable. There's a variety of options. There are so many options right now that weren't available 10 years ago um, that you have a lot more um, things to think about.